Welcome, everyone. We're glad you're worshiping with us today. This morning, we're going to explore what love is. We worship Almighty God, whose very nature is love. So what does that mean for us who try to follow God's commands to love? How does his nature of love shape our natures, shape our hearts, and shape our lives? In our readings and in the sermon that follows, we will hear the Apostle Paul speak in concrete terms of love and how we're to love other Christians and how we're to love people in the world at large. Then we will hear Jesus speak about his death on the cross and how that demonstrates ultimate love and how we demonstrate that same love when we pick up our crosses and follow him. Now let's begin our worship with prayer. Lord of all power and might, the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of your name. Increase in us true religion. Nourish us with all goodness and bring forth in us the fruits of good works. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Psalm 26 reminds us to hold God's love before our eyes and make trust and purity of heart our chief concerns. Give judgment for me, O Lord, for I have lived with integrity. I have trusted in the Lord and have not faltered. Test me, O Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. For your love is before my eyes. I have walked faithfully with you. I have not sat with the worthless, nor do I consort with the deceitful. I have hated the company of evildoers. I will not sit down with the wicked. I will wash my hands in innocence, O Lord, that I may go in procession round your altar, singing aloud a song of thanksgiving and recounting all your wonderful deeds. Lord, I love the house in which you dwell and the place where your glory abides. Peter made the mistake of telling Jesus that he, Jesus, was mistaken, that suffering wasn't part of God's plan for the Messiah. Jesus rebukes Peter, then uses this episode to talk about the cross we are to bear for the sake of his name. This is from Matthew 16, 21 through 28. 
Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom.
Let us pray. Take, O Lord God, take our hearts and set them on fire with new love for you. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. In 1985, the R&B artist Tina Turner had a big hit. This was a ballad about the thrill of a new love and, unfortunately, the heartache when that relationship ended. The broken expectations, the resentment, and even bitterness, and the jaded perspective about love. What's love got to do with it? Her plaintive voice refrains. What's love but a second-hand emotion? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? Too many people wallow in the self-pitying message of those lyrics. When a relationship doesn't work out the way we expect, how many of us are tempted to just throw up our hands and give up, give up on taking a risk on love? It's easier to despair because, after all, who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? Resignation to a broken heart may be the easiest decision to make, but that only encourages emotional and spiritual death and life isolated in depression, anxiety, and loneliness. We shrivel up and lose our bearings in God. But there is an alternative to floundering in the agony of a broken heart. And that's God's alternative. He offers us a completely opposite way of looking at love as nothing more than a secondhand emotion. To truly love, to truly live fully in the way God intends for each of us, love, love has got everything to do with that. We see this in a, the relationship between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and how important love is for the flourishing of their life together. The harmony of the Trinity is none other than the practice of love because love is the essence of God and the essence of life as God created it. God created all life so naturally his love is the source of life. Looking at the book of Genesis, we get a close-up look of God's love as it creates the planets and the stars, the seas and the earth, animals and human beings. We see God's ultimate creativity at work in the incarnation of his son, because this is how much God loved the world, the giving of his son so that whoever believes in him should never die, but have eternal life. What does all this have to do with us? Well, in today's passage from Romans, the apostle Paul tells us about love. And it might sound very similar to another passage about love written by Paul, 1 Corinthians 13. To the Corinthian church, Paul wrote, Love is patient. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast or dishonor others. It's not self-seeking or easily angered. In his letter to the church in Rome, Paul expands on the Corinthian passage with short exhortations that are all anchored in how Christ followers are to love, to not just love other Christians, but non-Christians also, by responding to God's call for humble and peaceable attitudes toward everyone. With rapid fire execution, Paul tells us love must be sincere, hate what is evil, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, bless those, bless those who persecute you, you can hear the echo from the Corinthians passage in this, can't you? And that's because the Corinthians passage provides the anchor from which the Roman passage expands on what God's love means, the love that we are to do unto others. This is Paul echoing Jesus' teaching and making love for other people the central focus of his exhortations. In this case, by specifying behavior that manifests sincere love. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil for evil. For Christians, to love is more than mere play acting when we put into practice Paul's commands. 
Live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. These exhortations illustrate for us that love is more than a feeling. True love anchored in God's love leads to a violent hatred of evil and a tenacious attachment to what is good. The manifestation of true love must first and always be exhibited within the church as a spiritual family, showing the intimacy and tenderness toward one another that mark the best earthly families. We must outdo one another in showing honor. In other words, in an expression of genuine love, we must put other believers first. But of course, sacrificing ourselves for the sake of other spiritual family members is not the only part of our call. Paul exhorts us to share the same love for believers with non-Christians. Again, echoing what Jesus has said, Paul commands that we bless those who persecute us. We rejoice with those who rejoice, and we live in harmony with one another. He calls on us, just as our Lord does, to turn the other cheek, displaying a love for others that goes far beyond the normal boundaries of human love, expanding and enlarging this narrow circle that we normally restrict our love to and bringing it into an ever wider area of human life within the scope of the power of our love. True love requires us to live alongside others, to engage with them in, in a full-bodied way, all of us, all, all of our being, not through the artificial ways that we try to express genuine love through things like social media, but in the kind of sacrificial, incarnational, face-to-face, eye-to-eye connection. Again, following the example of our Lord's life. These commands can be difficult, if not impossible, to obey. So how do we anchor our hearts and slowly, bit by bit, move out into the world to honor others, to even love our enemies? We've heard the answer already this morning in that well-known passage from Matthew's Gospel that shows us how to sacrificially express God's love. Jesus said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and pick up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. This is the key to living alongside others and expressing genuine love for them. Love is embodied by the cross of Christ enables us to sincerely express love, to live in harmony with one another, to not be conceited or proud, to not repay anyone evil for evil. As Jesus' as disciples, we must carry the cross. But like everything we do in life, there are consequences to carrying that cross to living a cruciform-shaped life and bearing the love of God. The prim primary consequence of cross-bearing, as for Jesus, is death and resurrection, ultimately leading to eternal life. This is a costly action of paying a penalty for human sins in a way that only God could design so we can live into the fullness of divine love, carrying with it the weight of self-denial, of self-sacrifice, this reality was something that we heard the Apostle Peter had to struggle with, probably the other disciples as well. He could not accept Jesus' words of self-denial and self-sacrifice, that he would go to Jerusalem, he would suffer and be killed. So Jesus needed to teach Peter. He needs to teach us as well how this gift of love, his death on the cross, leads to forgiveness, reconciliation with God, and eternal life. This is a hard teaching that Peter and the other disciples had to grapple with, as do we. But self-denial to be able to love and live lives characterized by all those commands that Paul wrote means to act as Jesus did in a holy, selfless manner. Jesus models a life that we frequently wrestle with as we attempt to follow him. Do we deny our fleshly human desires and agendas so that we can serve the Lord, setting aside self-love for selfless love? 
Or do we give in to our own desires and leave God's desires for his kingdom unfulfilled? And he has to look elsewhere for some other servant to fulfill those. When we commit ourselves to saying yes in response to Jesus' command to deny ourselves, pick up the cross and follow him, we can hardly know the implications of that commitment until we've gotten well on our way. For that commitment takes us as it did Jesus on the way of suffering before glory and service before reign. The way of the cross is for the present Glory and reward come only in the future when Jesus comes to reign. Just as Peter didn't understand, neither do we fully comprehend that present sufferings aren't worthy to be compared to future glory. Those of us who follow Jesus, we still need periodic reorientation, a rethinking to the values of God's kingdom. Glory and rewards await his faithful disciples but only after living a life overflowing with love and self-denying service that follow in Jesus' steps to the cross. Let's be clear about something. We often hear people say, I'm carrying my cross today, but this doesn't mean what a lot of people think. Enduring without complaint whatever burdens come along in life, an unfaithful spouse, chronic illness, difficult relationship with a child, God's love enables us to carry the cross with a willingness to suffer the consequences for proclaiming and living the gospel of Jesus Christ. Carrying the cross doesn't encourage people who are victimized or suffering to simply bear that cross as their way of identifying with Jesus. The gospel shows us that Jesus always healed and alleviated suffering. Denial of self is not simply self-denial in the sense of choosing to give up certain pleasures. Instead, it concerns the disciples' choice to lose themselves entirely in the love of Christ, to take on his way of life and mission and his very identity as one own identity. Earlier, as we heard today in Matthew's Gospel, Peter rebukes Jesus for speaking about what awaits him in Jerusalem. He will suffer at the hands of the chief priests and the elders and the teachers of the law and then be taken to the cross and die. But this is the ultimate gift of God's love. It's a hard road to walk, and that cross will be a hard cross for each of us to carry. Peter had his own ideas about life and what it meant, and so do we. Yet if we want to follow the way of God's love, we must put to death those ideas we harbor, those fantasies, those agendas, and nail them to that cross, allowing our wills to be subordinated to the will of God. This is what love is all about. Jesus teaches us to deny self, and that by doing so means that we must break ties that connect us to our deepest desires and wills. And we can only do that like Jesus did through the cross, with a love so deep and so wide and so high to embrace, to embrace this instrument of suffering and death. To follow Jesus is to align one's life with the one who showed us how much he loved the world by going to Jerusalem to suffer and be killed. For us to suffer and be killed doesn't necessarily mean becoming a martyr or living lives of poverty or any other number of equally difficult and painful scenarios, only by allowing our deepest desires to die for the sake of God's love and his kingdom can we find true life, can we find true love. Attempting to preserve those desires leads ultimately to our own destruction, while self-denial ultimately leads to self-fulfillment and the ability to truly love. Jesus reminds us, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. By loving in this way through the transforming and spiritual rebirth of our minds, our souls, and our hearts, we'll find ourselves living a radical and complete commitment to the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
Now to let us pray for hearts that love like God's heart, and let us pray for our world. Give wisdom, Lord, to all in authority, to leaders of nations and local communities, that actions and words are prompted by the needs of others, that all might ask, who is my neighbor? Seeing through your eyes what is best for others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, what we desire is this, that people see not us, but through our smile, greeting, helping hand, or helpful word, your love reach out and touch. Keep us focused through this day wherever you might lead us, and may your name be glorified. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all who work in stressful situations, health care, teaching, law enforcement, social services, and other occupations where patience, love, and perseverance can wear thin and daily stress levels rise. Keep them safe and keep them well, equipped to follow their vocation through the most difficult of times, and at the end of their day, grant them rest. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our communities, for people who are our neighbors. We pray for all of them, for those we know by name and those less familiar faces. Bless their homes and families and let your love and peace so shine in our communities that smiles turn to conversations and strangers become friends. We pray this through Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, and in whose name we pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace, and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.